Hi, everybody. Welcome to Metastellar. We're an online publication of speculative fiction. We publish original science fiction, fantasy, and horror, and also essays, news, book reviews, reprints, excerpts, and everything else of interest to people who like to read speculative fiction or watch it in TV or movies. Today, we have a science fiction author, Nikodal Nicholas Nerbutovsky. Do, do I did I get that anywhere in your right? Yes, Maria, absolutely. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm just gonna call you Nick. Is that okay? That works for me. Works for Excellent. me. <laughs> and Nick has a new book coming out, and I'm gonna throw that book cover up here behind me. Here we have Steel in the Blood, uh, and it's gonna be available for pre-order on July 23rd, which is today. And because uh, we're, we're filming yesterday, but we're airing tomorrow. So the book is available for pre-order today. Yep, you can, you can go out and get it done now. <laughs> and all the links are going to be in the description below. So just scroll down and you'll be able to find everything. So uh, this is uh, hard science fiction, space opera, battles, all that good stuff that I look for in a book. And Nick's an old friend of mine, so I've actually read uh, earlier versions of the book and commented on them. So that was pretty exciting for me to now see this, this baby being born, so to speak. <laughs> uh, and uh, so Nick, and Nick, you've got a, you got a fantastic background. Uh, Nick's a member of one of the writing groups that I'm in, and he's just has the most awesome background to, for a science fiction writer. And can you tell our audience about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, thank you so much for uh, for having me here. Um, I, I love Metastellar. Um, it's actually one of the uh, the first uh, magazines I, I got something printed in. So like it's a special place in my heart. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, Nick is a regular <laughs> columnist for us at Metastellar. <laughs> Yeah, I write the uh, the classics column, and you know, born out of a love of science fiction, but uh, all the '50s and '60s good stories that uh, that still are relevant today. But um, my background, uh, I am a active duty Air Force officer. Um, I fly uh, for Air Force Special Operations Command, and uh, I have been reading and writing science fiction for most of my life. Um, okay, the, okay, okay. Stop right there. How many UFOs have you seen, and are <laughs> they real? This is <laughs> the the answer is two, and uh, they existed. I'm pretty sure, uh, but I don't know what they are or where they're from or any of that stuff. I mean, all, all I know is that I couldn't identify it. Okay, so. <laughs> what, 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 tell us more. Are you allowed to, or are you like under gag orders? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, it's it's usually just you see a light out of the corner of your eye, and by the time you go to look at it, whatever it is is gone. It's usually an airplane. Oh, okay. Pretty, pretty boring stuff. It's so. it's like those photographs of Bigfoot that are always wind up really, really fuzzy and out of focus, and you can't really tell what's in it. Yeah, I mean, it was probably a bear the whole time. Yeah, that's really disappointing. <laughs> All right, go continue. Uh, no worries. Um, so yeah writing and reading science fiction my whole life. Um, I wrote uh, my first science fiction story when I was in high school. Um, and uh, I have since gone back and read it and like cringed my way through the whole thing. Uh, but I still wanted to get back into into writing because I love I, I love science fiction, uh, not just for the good stories and the enjoyment that you can get out of a good science fiction story, but for the fact that uh, it's one of the only genres uh, that can flat out lie to you the whole time and tell you things that don't exist and may never exist but it can still reveal truths about what it's like to be a person what it's like to live in the universe like all of these things that, that we're, we're really searching for um, you can find those in science fiction um, even though the worlds are all made up and, and, and none of it may come to pass so um, my, my very first foray into science fiction was a book called Ringworld by Larry Niven. Um, if, you've, if you know anything about science fiction, you've probably heard of Larry Niven. But uh, I read that at the age of nine, which uh, was a little early for most uh, Niven books. But uh, ever since then, it's been uh, just diving down the rabbit hole. Uh, and honestly, I'm 
it's still kind of sinking in that uh, that that uh, I've been picked up by a New Degree Press to to publish this book. So um, lots of work left to do, but uh, I'm really excited, uh, and I want as many people to come with me on the journey as I can. So tell us a little bit about the book. Give people a little preview of what they can expect. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Robert Silverberg has a great book called um, Worlds and Wonder, and it's basically his his take on the the science fiction writer's textbook, even though he doesn't actually treat it like a textbook because he's a good writer. Uh, but um, in there, his his general theme that he pulls out is a good science fiction story has a uh, as an interesting science or technology related uh, what if, and then it's carried to a logical conclusion with good characters, a good setting, and a good plot. So um, I'll say all that to say that uh, this book began as uh, a, a question that I was uh, sitting on the couch uh, just pondering uh, what would a stable interstellar empire look like uh, in, in the realm of humanity, right? Like, what would humans? look like if we had a, a stable interstellar society. Um, and so from there, it was a whole bunch of, well, you need this, and you do that, you do the other thing. And um, ultimately, to have a stable empire, you need uh, a way to uh, communicate quickly and effectively across the entire gulf of the empire, and then a way to project or maintain power. And so I thought, you know, how, how, how might that come to pass? So. Um, Fast forward a few months later, world building every day, and uh, you get the uh, the universe of steel and the blood, where the uh, empire of humanity has spread across a thousand suns. Um, it's set two thousand years or so in the future. I don't nail down any hard dates because uh, they'll always be wrong. But uh, the the empress of humanity is is actually an accidental empress. Um, all of the all of the software in the entire uh, empire is keyed the uh, the source code is encrypted to her full human genome. Um, and so she's the only one that can rewrite the source code or, or change that deep level programming. Um, and then the executors who are basically the executors of her will. So um, think of them as dukes or barons equivalent. Uh, they have been gifted a, a portion of her genome in their blood, hence the, in, in the blood piece. Uh, and so they are able to use the technology and to employ it, but they can't change what it's for and they can't change the base nature of their reality, which is how she maintains that power. Um, and then the other ingredient you need is a, a way to communicate quickly and, and, and project that power, right? So um, this is where I dove a little bit too far into the physics side, <laughs> uh, the science and the science fiction, but uh, I, I found some really interesting ideas about how wormholes might work uh, and how one might fold space time together. Uh, and so I kind of seeded that in there with uh, assuming we could create negative energy, which we can't get, but like that's the, the hand waving in, in the science fiction piece. But you need a fantastic amount of, of just regular energy to create it, right? So by necessity, opening these folds is incredibly expensive. Um, think you're, you need to use a, a star to generate antimatter for like long amounts of time until you have enough built up to be able to, to fold across, you know, 10, 15, 20 light years. Uh, and so you, that leads you to not want to keep it open very long and only to open it if it's profitable to you. And so what, what winds up happening is you have a trade empire where the periphery stars or, or those, uh, those um, planets that orbit stars that are very massive, um, they mine the star for raw materials, they package it up, they trade it across the fold boundaries, everything happens very quickly because they want to keep the fold open as little as possible. Um, messages are, are message in a bottle style where everything is saved up until there's a fold and then it's tossed across the boundary. Um, and so you have this pseudo feudal society that kind of relies on this incredibly high technology, but functions much more like you you might find in ancient Rome. So, yeah, uh, I've been rereading the Federation because the TV show is coming out, mm -hmm. and uh, in the TV show in particular, they have a genetics based 
emperor based on the Roman Empire. And I read that Isaac Asimov actually based it because he was reading the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, and he wanted to write a book like that. And in the TV show, I think they're using the emperor as his own clone. So it's kind of kind of weird. Uh, that reminded me a lot of that, except your book has a lot of action in it. And Asimov's foundation has like zero action in it. And the entire fall of the empire takes place between chapter one and chapter two of the first book. <laughs> so <laughs> I think in the t in TV show, oh, that was my cat. I think in the TV show, they're like expanding that little like paragraph into the entire series. <laughs> um, yeah, Asimov did not waste any time with uh with toppling interstellar empires so um i'm gonna draw mine out a little bit more maybe maybe it'll fall maybe it won't i don't know we'll see was that one of the inspirations for the book or is it just a coincidence that your book is coming out at the same time as tv show is so um i have a lot of i have a lot of influences because i've read a lot but yes um as a most foundation series was another one of the very first uh um, series that i read uh, and you're right it is much more cerebral um i've I've sneakily used the idea of psychohistory and predicting what large numbers of people will do in uh, in education things that I've done in the past. And people are like, "Wait a second, what's psychohistory?" And then I got to explain that it doesn't actually exist. And just just believe me for now. But um, Dune was another really big influence mm -hmm. on me. Um, I've always mm -hmm. loved Dune and the Dune universe. Um, the first movie was was campy and it was okay. But the Sci-Fi Channel, I think it was in the late '90s, early 2000s, they did a, a whole mini series of Dune, which was actually really well done. Um, so I'm really excited for uh, the new Dennis Villanueva um, version of Dune to come out. But mm -hmm. yes, Dune, um, James S. A. Corey, uh, their their work with the Expanse is fantastic. Um, it's it's it all kind of like flows together. So. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say your novel reads in a very cinematic modern way. And I can definitely see it being like say a miniseries. So well, <laughs> <laughs> fingers crossed, one step at a time. But yeah, no, that would be uh man, I, I just I'm happy enough just to have have the book getting published. I can't imagine what, <laughs> what that would feel like. So. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the logistics here. Mm -hmm. So there's the pre-order info. And again, all that stuff is going to be linked down below. So you don't have to worry about copying anything down. Uh, and we're going to have the social media link and that little QR code thing. Uh, we're going to have that link down below as well. Now, the pre-orders start on July 23rd. When can people actually buy the book? So the, the pre-order campaign is, uh, by the time this is out, should, should definitely be uh, up and running. Um, but the, uh, the book will, will actually publish, uh, come off the presses um, in December of 2021. Uh, it will be, okay. I'm told, in time for, for Christmas. So should be shipping the, the first or second week of, of December. Um, but the, the, the pre-order campaign is, is so much more than just, you know, pre-ordering the book and then you get a book. It's, it's, it's much more than that. Um, there's still, there's still lots of room for this, uh, for this story to grow. So, um, I'm working with my editor very closely to do some of the last final revisions, but, uh, anybody who, who signs up and, 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 and gets involved in the campaign is going to get a chance to read excerpts of the book beforehand, provide me feedback um, that might go into revisions and changes for the final version, um, early access to the prologue, which is, uh, you know, I think it's going to really set the stage for the whole series, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and then also things like cover art. So what you see there is, is just a first pass at the cover art. Um, New Degree has some really talented artists on, on staff. And so they're going to come up with several different options um, for that. And so you'll get to vote on what the cover eventually looks like. Um, you are and everybody... t-shirts, right? Of the cover art? <laughs> because I want to get one. I'm collecting sci-fi t-shirts right now. So I'm wearing one for Metastellar, available on our merch nice. store. Uh... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, so yeah, we'll... Uh, we, we we will cross the merch boat when uh, when we get there. Um, I think, but uh, well, sign me up for one. You got I'm, it. I'm, bu I'm building my sci-fi T-shirt collection. 
<laughs> I'm, I've got one already, so I'm well in the way. One of the, one of the coolest things that, uh, that 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 they told me what they were going to do is if we if we hit a certain um, dollar amount on the campaign and it's all listed on the on the campaign page for community goals, um, they'll uh, they'll ask one of their artists to actually draw character art for everybody. So you'll get a a um, a one off copy of uh, of character art from uh, characters in the book. So you might get um, Eric, who's the, uh, the one of the main characters, executor of the uh, Gene Line Olsen. You might get his daughter Bryn, who is uh, a, a little more aggressive than he is, and uh, and she's the one that's going to defend uh, their their country. You might even get uh, a character art piece of uh, the mendicant, the the AI sidekick who offers secrets so yeah should be good so talk to me about the little romance that's happening in the book <laughs> so for science fiction uh well maybe i haven't been reading the the latest latest stuff uh but uh science fiction often tends to be very kind of binary and more it's supposed to be innovative and set in the future but it often seems to be like traditional in terms of gender roles and relationships and stuff like that and you're pushing the boundaries a little bit here can you talk about that yeah absolutely so um there 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 are a couple of romance subplots here because uh, anytime you get people around each other they're either going to fall in love or fight that's human nature 101 right um so you'll get you'll get plenty of both but uh the the main romance that evolves in the in the book um it really does kind of defy any sort of gender or um traditional roles uh partly because of the the people who are involved and uh, i don't want to give away too much but uh that is that is a big part of it um there's a lot of a lot of self-discovery and change that goes on with our with our main character there so um, I, I can totally tell you about the other sub, subplot uh, romance, um, Bryn and uh, Azita, who is the, uh, the daughter of another executor. They are um, madly in love, but they don't uh, necessarily get a chance to see each other very often because they are the heirs to their relative kingdoms. But um, the strength of that relationship uh, ends up really helping Bryn out later on uh, when she goes through some rough patches. So oh that is really cool uh so i'm very excited to see to see the final version um i'm definitely going to be signing up for an uh, early copy i recommend all our readers do the same having read the book i can totally vouch for it that it's going to be a fun read and you and you will enjoy it if you like this kind of you know, space operas and action and daring do and romance and space empires um, and all that jazz. All right, so um, we're almost out of time. So is there anything else you want to add before we go? Um, just that uh, I really uh, am, am humbled and grateful to everybody who has, uh, has made this project what it is maria for your comments um they've, they've been very uh very helpful um just to, to make this a better book um big shout out to uh christina watt who um has been uh my critique partner in crime she she and i are critiquing each other's novels as we go through um and and everybody else who's, who's made this uh, what it and is she's and she's working also... on a space opera too and hopefully we'll be talking to her soon as well she is. Her book is awesome. Uh, I've, I've read the whole thing. It's it's fantastic. Don't miss that one. Um, but the other piece of this is that uh, it's it's going to take more people to to make this story into a book. And so I really do want everybody who who wants to be involved, come out, uh, be involved, uh, join the community that we're we're trying to build around this. And uh, this is just the first book of a, of a series. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll make this a long term relationship. Oh, one other thing. Um, an interesting perk that you can that you can uh, purchase on the on the pre-order campaign is if you want to, you can get a character who is loosely based on you written into the sequel of this book. Um, and killed in horrible spacey ways. Well, yes, I mean space is dangerous, <laughs> so um, they they will die in a creative fashion. Uh, <laughs> 
there are a few slots left where they will not die in the next book. So, I mean, it depends on, on what you want your, your character to do. There's not many of those slots because it's a book and you can only write so many characters in. I am not George R. R. Martin, but uh, those are, but those hey, are some options as well. If they die in the same scene where they appear, you know, you can have your body count as high as you want, right? Just list the <laughs> names of all the guards who are killed in various, like a Kill Bill kind of scenario. Right. I mean, I will, I will try and draw it out a little <laughs> bit more than that. But no, there, there are some, uh, some very interesting ways you can die in space. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about it. And uh, everybody, uh, please support us on May Patreon. Your support helps us pay for original speculative fiction on our website. And we're all volunteers. So all your money goes straight to paying authors to write because so, we want to we want to support uh, especially emerging and independent authors. Um, we also have merch on sale, both on Amazon and Cafe Press. Also, the links uh, below. And if you like this interview, hit the like button and hit the subscribe button and all the other stuff that people do on YouTube. Uh, I don't even know all of it. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's somewhere there around on the screen around you. All right. Uh, thank you, Nick. And I hope to see you back to talk maybe about the Federation TV show as we get closer to seeing it go up. Maybe talk uh, about whether the Federation books still hold up or not. I would absolutely love that. If even if you just want to shoot me a message on Twitter, I am down to talk about science fiction at any point. So, I well, consider this a standing <laughs> invitation, uh, and uh, just get back to me, and we'll we'll get that organized. And I'll see you on Sunday anyway. All right, I'll see you All on right. Sunday. Sounds good, Maria. All right, thanks. Bye bye.